Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Madeline De Delfa, and I am the Assistant Director of Programs and Community Engagement at the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis University. I'm so grateful to all of you for joining In Conversation Salman Tour, a program offered in conjunction with the exhibition Salman Tour No Ordinary Love, organized by the Baltimore Museum of Art and curated by Dr. Asma Naeem, Dorothy Wagner Wallace Director of the Baltimore Museum of Art. We would like to thank our generous supporters who made this exhibition possible. Major support for this exhibition is provided by the Further Forward Foundation in memory of Jennifer Combs, with additional support from Adam Green, Beth Marcus, Lance Renner, and the Green Family Art Foundation. Support for the catalog was provided by Charlotte Wagner and the Wagner Foundation. And finally, we would like to thank our media partner, WBUR. We hope you visit the Rose to experience this exhibition in person. It is on view through February 11th. It's a stunning show and you do not want to miss it. So now I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Ganit Ankori, Henry and Lois Foster Director and Chief Curator. Ganit worked closely with Salman on the Rose presentation of this exhibition and we are very pleased to welcome them both tonight for what is sure to be a fascinating conversation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ganit Ankori who will introduce Salman Tour. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie, and thank you, Max, from our media, uh, media and technology services at Brandeis for bringing us all together here. Um, and of course, thank you to our water wonderful audience. I see literally hundreds of people from all over coming here on this uh, first evening of February. Um, we know there are other things you could be doing, so we're delighted that you chose to join the Rose Art Museum program. I certainly understand why you are here. I am also absolutely thrilled to spend time with the wonderful artist and brilliant human being, uh, Salman Tour. Um, and thank you, Salman, uh, so much for being here and uh, walking through the exhibition virtually with us. Um, beyond that, thank you for allowing our museum and me personally the incredible pleasure of uh, living, exhibiting with your art. Uh, it's been such an honor to spend time with the paintings, the drawings, the sketchbook, you know, the entire Rose team, I, I find them instead of in the offices, they're in the galleries just being inspired by the work. Uh, so I, I think most of you know, uh, Salman Tour was born in 1983 in Lahore, Pakistan. Today he lives and works in New York. So this in-between position between cultures, between different art traditions is something that may be found in his work. His uh, first major museum show titled Salman Tour, How Will I Know, was presented at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York in 2020 to 2021. Um, so starting right at the top at the Whitney, I think it's even before you had, uh, you were represented by a gallery, uh, incredible. But since then, Salman has shown uh, his luminous art really across the globe, including uh, Beijing and Pakistan and India and Europe, of course. And very soon, uh, this is kind of a sneak peek um, without visuals, but um, you will be showing your art at the Venice Biennale. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> and um, it's part of the show in the Arsenale. And uh, you want to tell us something about it? Because I know we didn't bring visuals. You can go to Venice and see the work there. Yes, the work is going to be up for, um, I think, until November. So there's quite some time. It starts in April. And, uh, you know, in my imagination, it's the most glamorous thing that can happen to anyone so I'm just un, you know I, I can hardly believe it but um you know it started with a couple of meetings with uh, a very strict looking curator who you know is, is very serious and does not smile very much and you know they came to the studio and um you know it was kind of like a test and I was like oh my god I don't know maybe maybe not and like you know they came several times and nothing was really confirmed and um it was still quite a way away um and then eventually we like kind of 
you know, talked about like what what was going to be the theme of the uh, the show at that time. It was very early; they didn't know. But eventually, it was uh, a theme called "Foreigners Everywhere." I think that's something that's possibly, you know, um, a political sort of climate, and it's something that's on the minds of Europeans uh, in many different ways. Um, and uh, it's a theme that resonates with me as well. And um, just to make it easier, I was just like, like you know, what do you, what do you, what would you like me to do? Because like I, 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 you know, I, I'll just go crazy like trying to think like what, what would I make for the for the biennial? So, uh, you know, I, I did, I had plenty of time, so I did a ton of stuff, and um, um, you know, some 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 paintings made it, and some paintings didn't make it, um. Some of the paintings that didn't make it ended up in other shows that are happening in in Paris. There's another show at the Bous um, du Commerce that opens in March, uh, where I have two large scale paintings. Um, they were done initially for the uh, for the biennial, but uh, they ended up somewhere else. Uh, but I ended up having maybe six, I think six or seven works in the biennial. One of them is a large uh, scale painting that drove me half mad um, because, you know, nothing I did was good enough. Uh, so uh, I did that painting for four months. I mean, just nothing else. I, I don't even know what it looks like anymore. I hope it's, I hope it does something to viewers, uh, you know, other than me, because I've been looking at this in different permutations for months. Like I would do something, then I thought it was crap. And then I would like <laughs> scrape most parts of it off and then do it again, then do it again. Um, and, you know, maybe hopefully someday I'll be able to show all the other pictures that are underneath that large painting um, <laughs> that, were, that didn't make it to the final cut. Um, mm -hmm. But so in a nutshell, I have seven works in that show and um it's it's a dream it is a dream and you know people should go to uh paris a little uh beginning of april and then continue to venice and see all the salmon tour uh works there oh. uh but before you guys do you have a chance to look at uh the rose uh exhibition virtually uh, it closes, really, I already feel bereft, but it closes in 10 days on February 11th. So, you know, there are two weekends and a few and like a, a weeks, a few weeks, like a week to see it. Please come to the Rose. Um, here are some installation shots. Um, you see uh, the, you know, we, uh, someone was very, very generous when I came to visit the studio and told him about the Rose iteration. We wanted to include some quotes and you were very kind. And uh, we wanted okay. to have a lot of the uh, works relate to each other. Um, so although we did use the original categories that Dr. Asma Naim uh, used in Baltimore when she curated the show, the two categories or the section texts were about tradition and family, and we kept those two uh, very important categories, but we will see how they overlap and how we also uh, clustered some of the works so that they talk about other genres uh, as well. And uh, you see the beautiful, really stunning work and the installation. And these uh, images, uh, the wonderful photographer, Julia Feathering Gill, it does not do justice to the work. That is textures and, and luminous and really works um, viscerally on viewers. Um, so I don't know why it's not moving. Well, in the meantime, I just want to thank you um, for the beautiful wall color that we sort of agreed on because there's so much green in the show. And I, you know, I, I'm sort of always 
want to go for something that's like the opposite of it, like a violet or um, something that makes the paintings pop. Uh -oh. Would you like me to share? I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Oh, Zoom. We love Zoom. Aha, success. Yay. So I'm sorry about those technical difficulties. Um, so as Ganit was saying, let me uh, turn my camera on here so people can see me. <clears throat> so we have this beautiful um, painting, Mommy, which just hit my hand. It's one of my favorite paintings in the show. Um, would you like to show us a little or tell us a little bit about this painting, Salman? Yeah, so um, this was kind of a, I would say, like a set of paintings that I was thinking about regarding just family and parents. And um, but this one in particular, um, there is there is a mirror that was kind of like a vanity, like the dressing table mirror that my mother had that was like very much this shape and I just thought at some point that I wanted to do a composition with it and um, it's kind of like a, a sort of like a rite of passage or a cliched story that I've been thinking about for a while of um, of like a, a young sort of like queer boy with like you know um, watching the rituals of sort of like beautifying and um, having um, you know, like uh, the watching the power of 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 beauty, um, and seeing themselves reflected in the story of beauty and reflections, and um, and you know, for for me, like a lot of it was also very aesthetic. Like I wanted deeply to work with this particular color, which is like a very uh, to me like a very warm glow. Um, which I feel like in my kind of rose tinted imagination, like I thought of as um, remembering um, like an older sort of home in which my mother and my family and I sort of like grew up uh, in my parents' bedroom. Um, and then ending up with a kind of m menagerie of like bottles and potions and perfumes um, that sort of ignited my imagination as uh as a as a kid um so yeah. yeah those were some of the kind of things that I was that I was thinking about I was very it, this was one of those paintings that happened very quickly it doesn't always happen that way uh some paintings it doesn't matter how small or big they are they can be just torturous and um this was this was a lucky strike and uh and lucky strikes are very important to me because um, they make me think I can do anything, you know. Um, <laughs> and yeah, well, well, yeah, let's see. But like, and then, um, yeah. So this was uh, um, yeah. this was a good one. <laughs> so, so this one, um, although we uh, we put it in together with the family, it also relates to art historical precedents like Venus at her toilet or uh, Susanna and the elders, you know, women looking at each other. Uh, but what we loved here is the reflection of you as a small boy um, 
And this one, uh, a lot of us were thinking almost like a pearl, uh, that the compact looks um, very feminine also, uh, but also with the pinks and everything, but also almost like a pearl. And then in the, like almost trying on your mother's hair here in the corner. Oh, sure. So um, identity formation, uh, if we think of Lacan's mirror stage, uh, how your identity formed, uh, looking at your mom at, at mommy um yeah, and mommy. yeah i mean it's just like it's it's kind of uh you know loving that process and that question about you know nature and nurture and culture and like um and you know why like this very recurring sort of gay story um um and you know the formation of like an early identity like what is that about and like how um you know, sort of th to think about that in a in a way that is full of reflection and and, yeah. and 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 beauty and kind of forging that relationship with um a parent who you know may not be a willing participant in this actually and may actually be a conservative person, but um who is a very you know inspirational figure um right. to a young artist you know. An artist in the making. Yes. And, <laughs> and this is uh, one of my favorites, which, um, you know, I look at it often and I think I could fit it into my bag. I shouldn't say that. Out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's yours. I know you hung on to it. But mm -hmm. again, um, I always imagine this as you as around nine, you know, before you get to the double digit ages when you're mm -hmm. still... Uh, forging yourself and still in within the women's world and the painted passages here are just so beautiful and um yeah I mean you just enjoy as you said the beauty of it and then here already contemplating uh your own identity not in the shadow of your mommy but here yourself and um I feel like I'm you so enjoy painting. Someone, someone decided to like hammer a nail at, on Thursday night <laughs> in my apartment. Uh, the I guess like the apartment adjacent to me. Uh, anyway, sorry, I do to interrupt you, but um, yeah. So this is uh, this is possibly the oldest painting in the show, um, and I think that it's probably helpful to remind everyone this show has been traveling for a while. So. A lot of these paintings are already maybe two years old. Maybe this was maybe done in, um, you know, a while ago and before them. And um, and also, you know, they're not literally autobiographical. This didn't literally happen. Uh, but they are, you know, I use memory to uh, just to make the process urgent and speedy because I'm um, I'm sort of less, um, you know, kind of um, inclined toward what the painting looks like. I'm just like, I'm remembering like what, what you know, what was my kind of aunt's bedroom like, like where my mother and her sister sort of hung out on the bed and had tea. And like, there was this, all this like, you know, diaphanous, you know, sort of um, scarves and like, you know, jasmine and tea and uh, perfume and, uh, and just this uh, sort of the world of, of women where the curtains are drawn mostly okay. in a place like in a place like Pakistan. This is very unlike later paintings. It's evoking a very particular place. Um, I think that um, you know at this point, I this painting was also done on some level for myself. I didn't really want to like explain like to anyone that this is oh this is not America like this is happening somewhere else you know yeah. I guess that's very obvious anyway but um but um you know it's a it's a place of um it's a place of scent and 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 warmth um and you know I think one of the recurring things uh in a painting like this is that it's also a safe space um, and safe spaces in the later sort of paintings that I did in the later part of my life are filled with other people. They're not the women that I grew up with, but friends. Um, right. um, you know, I guess like the evoking 
the rite of passage for like 20 some things, you know, straight out of liberal arts colleges who are just like, you know, very, very full of energy and promise and um, so much idealism and chosen family and sort of, you know, I can do anything and that kind of thing. And so um, I see these, uh, I see this painting related to other works in that way. Right, uh, right. And we actually hung them uh, like on the same wall back to back, the interiors right. of your childhood family and the interiors of apartments in New York with your chosen family, which we will get to shortly. There's one more mirrored image that we brought to show today, which uh, is a, a little older, an adolescent boy. Now he doesn't need the women or the mother uh, as an excuse to look in the mirror and uh, go on. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe that's true. Uh, maybe, it's, <laughs> uh, maybe it's not true. Sure. But like, um, um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I uh, wanted to do a kind of traditional nude in that way um and um it's a sort of image of self-love like and self-empowerment um an augmenting sense of self um but uh, another way of looking at it for me is apart from it being a composition that i like uh, this sort of composition that sort of fits into the picture in a compact way um is that uh, is is there's also a story about body types in in Western art history and even I would say like maybe medieval like Indian art history uh, and like how you know sort of playing with the cliches of them and confusing them and subverting both kinds of cliches um, but bodies that are you know dark skinned or hairy and you know um, and playing with some you know, sort of Western anxieties about where that, what kind of spaces that body fits in, in, in paintings that are supposed to be in elegant spaces. Um, and um, so that I enjoy that um, intrusion or subversion, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but on a very simple level, I just, I really enjoy painting the body and, um, and, you know, I'm also sort of um, within an image at, at war with very, very traditional painting, which I did for uh, a long time and for about a decade of my life. I just mm -hmm. wanted to um, be an academic painter and that was a lifetime's worth of learning, you know, and um, and then sort of getting tired of it and wanting to move on and uh, and screw things up a little bit. <laughs> see right, what right. So in terms of, you know, we might expect to see uh, uh, a white woman looking in the mirror in a certain way in the works of Renaissance and Baroque that you looked at. Mm -hmm. And here we have a man who might be more brown. And uh, uh, I mean, as you said, you're, you're kind of making it your own, uh, both... Um, working with the stereotypes but and and with the genre but also subverting it and making something else out of it um i wanted to move from the interior to the exterior of the house and uh use this uh monumental work which is called back lawn uh because it has a lot of the elements that uh, different parts of the show have. Instead of the interior of the family house, we have the, the as you said, this is a, a house that people who had been to Pakistan and Lahore would recognize. Um, and the family is outside here, but then you also have nature. And within nature, you don't just have the cats and the dogs sometimes, but you also have a kind of forbidden or queer uh, passion or love or desire um, and trees that have different shadows. And um, that brings us to this other uh, area that we put together several works that have nature as uh, scenes of um, cruising and that kind of mix up Pakistan and New York and the different areas. Uh, would you like to uh, talk about this kind of uh, 
uh, scene that we have. I think we have this one and then we have the um, graveyard scene, the cemetery scene. Yeah, um, you know, I when I started these, these um, sort of paintings um, maybe five years ago, I was very, I was sort of, I, I felt very satisfied kind of doing very specific places and things and remembering and like sort of doing that. And then I felt like in, like in two years, I felt a little bit trapped by that. And I was like, no, I just want like to make something slightly allegorical or surreal, like, and, you know, um, you know, what the, the great part about going back from, uh, from Pakistan or Lahore to New York is that a part of it is with me and like, um, and it travels with me and that's the same thing happens when I go back, if I go back, um, you know, annually. And um, so there are a bunch of images in the show that, like this that are just, they're not a particular place. Um, and, you know, uh, nature uh, or yeah, the woods are a place of um, danger and they're a place of sex but they're also a place where, uh, of, of, of nightmares, you know, of dead ends for people being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and, you know, by saying that, I mean, like I grew up in a, um, but I was much younger, like, you know, I've been living in New York for a very long time now, but I was much younger. I grew up in a very patriarchal social system, uh, which meant that if someone, you know, um, like me, who got in trouble, like, uh, in any way, um, you know, everyone will believe that I was just asking for it, you know, um, that, I, you know, one of the sort of rules that people go by in, in, a, in a social system like that is that don't get caught. <laughs> if you do, then you're on your own. And it's a very, um, I think to grow up as a kid, believing or knowing that that's what the dominant belief is um is it's uh you know there's a there's a price to pay for that um and that um kind of uh, you know that was the where the paintings were coming from you know things that actually happened and things that i also imagined could happen um um or things that happened to my friends actually you know um so um so so we actually moved from from an area where there's uh the thrill of the uh of nature of trees of uh maybe some cruising to this section right. where we have the uh actual terror and fear and the nightmare and uh so this is one of the uh, works that we were really lucky to bring from the um, Green Family Art Foundation right. in Dallas, and it wasn't in the other shows. And it does show the dangers lurking when you go after your desires in a place, I mean, in any place, let's face it. Yeah, it, it could happen anywhere, really, because like, you know, I um, sometimes my friends are like, you know, let's, you know, why don't we go for a road trip across the U.S. and I'm just like, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Certain states you don't want to go like, Well, yeah, like, you know, all the way from here, like going south into L.A. Uh, and, you know, so um, these cities, especially in New York, is like a bastion of, um, that's why I, you know, love to live here and will always live here um, because it's, it's uh, unlike you know, any other place in, in the States or even in Pakistan, they're very, very similar in many ways. Um, but this this painting was shown um, at the, uh, for the, it was made for the Whitney show, it was shown there. Um, and um, it's a kind of, you know, I was thinking, this is the first time I did this kind of composition um, of uh, what I thought of as like a dark story, slightly, yeah, yeah it was, it's an ambiguous scene of, you know, like a pre-violent or like post-violence scene. Um, and to be honest, I didn't really know or understand completely myself what's happening here. Um, what I started painting with uh, the figure that is 
kind of supine in the middle. Um, and initially that was the entire composition. Um, and then I painted the guy on the right who's holding some kind of rock and sort of contemplating it. And, um, and then the composition was incomplete because the third person was sort of like very shadowy. And um, there was something about, I've been looking at a lot of uh, Victorian mullioned windows um, that in that kind of wrought iron diamond shape. Um, and in many of the kind of classics of um, Victorian literature, like there's always like a, and there's always sort of some, you know, vagabond or some, someone who's seeking refuge and there's that window in the storm and then it always has this mullioned window. And, yeah. uh, and uh, so I just, I, I wanted, I wanted that, um, that design kind of projected onto the clothes of this um, third yeah. character as, as a place of safety and or some sort of hope and um but and then in the very end I you know because behind there was just it was just a blank composition and I wanted it to be a very kind of a dead end sort of yeah place. um so um you know to be honest, like if I did this painting again, I would do it differently. <laughs> but well, yeah. and you but will. <laughs> that was 2018 or 19, I think. Um, that was very different. Um, yeah. yeah, it's 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 too vivid for my taste now, but uh, some parts of it I still love very much. Well, there's something about the foreshortening of the figure that looks almost like uh, um I don't know, Caravaggio or Baroque painting with the foreshortening or something oh, for like sure. that. For sure. I mean, uh, I, I, didn't so I see, them. I see, you know, you know, it's, it's taking uh, something like that. And uh, we have another one that we are showing night capture, which uh, also has that kind of dramatic thing, but you also have like these lights and uh, elements, um, you know, you move from the thrill to the actual danger and um, the trees that we saw that were kind of ominous and uh, lurking, uh, you see them here as well. And uh, the danger that's there. Um, and then the stone throwers also show something, you know, like, I don't know who these people are. Uh, they look ancient, but then they have a cell phone with a, with a um, yeah. you know, with a flashlight, but they're trying to, maybe uh, do some damage onto someone who's perhaps on the ground. So that kind of danger that you felt growing up them. Um, I wanna also say that already, according to what you've told us, already in Lahore, you found a chosen family through the art class, the art room. And maybe you can tell us something about that. And uh, I'll move to the next slide where we actually see people uh, maybe this is a vigil, but people okay. together, people walking together, that you weren't all alone in that environment. Oh, yes, uh, not at all. Um, I was very, very lucky. I I, I found friends and, um, you know, um, people who are artists, I think most importantly, um, you know, who are committed to some, to imagining as kids what, what an artist's life would be like as an adult we you know never thought that i never thought that i would move abroad uh that was not i'd hardly been abroad and um and uh so you know there were um, lucky i think you know we lucked out because there were people um among the elite who collected a lot of art um and um some of them were my friends parents and they would take us to artist studios to help us you know imagine what what is you know what who are these people like how do they live and um and some you know there were some really deeply inspiring moments where in high school there was a figurative painter who's a, a christian uh, he had a christian name he's a christian guy called colin david and uh, we went to his studio and he had a basement filled with these beautiful nudes, like uh, mostly just women. And I think he had models 
for them. And I was just entranced. I you, you, just like, you know, I, I didn't have an, I'd never seen an easel that big <laughs> before. <laughs> uh, you know, all these custom made things and like these beautiful paints and the gorgeous uh, overused like bristle brushes. Um, and it was completely magical because uh, we would sort of spin these stories around the portraits that he had done of of uh, people in the 70s. Um, they just, you know, we, I think that we would spin our own fantasies around those people. Uh, mm. I think that they were liberal, they were freer, that they liked people like us. Mm. Um, I think possibly we were, you know, kind of young kids who were just, you know, drawing out the role of an artist and dreaming about a very interesting life filled with, uh, filled with um, art and glamour and, and you know, um, and adventure. And um, so I guess, you know, I, I, I was very, very lucky that way. I had that from uh, an early age. Yeah, the imagination, yeah. the art, the friendship, and the, you know, dare to dream that you can do it. And uh, here, this is one of everybody's favorite painting, The Latecomer. And we joke because it actually did come late to the, it was the last <laughs> painting that came. And we installed it and then we knew that everything was done. But, you know, the, the figure that's both uh, alone and accompanied and, um, Maddie put the quote that uh, we chose about green being very hot and very cold, being poisoned nocturnal, but also Jew-like. And I want to say that I think part of the power of a lot of the paintings is that, yeah, they're they're beautiful, they're sumptuous. Uh, we are attracted to the colors and the shapes and the themes, but they also have this conflict. Things are both dangerous and seductive. They're right. both poisonous and just beautiful. And this man is alone, but also am among friends. And that kind of um, complexity is in most of your works and makes it so interesting. Yeah, I uh, thank you. I, um, I, you know, love the form of the short story like I just like I think that some when I'm doing a painting of this scale I love kind of thinking about it like a short story especially yeah. if it has people in it and kind of I'm kind of constructing like different corners of it and thinking um um about how like you know it's a story of arrival um and I wanted very much for the narrative for the protagonist to be sort of like highlight among this um, dark kind of urban dive place. And um, it's sort of mixed with the, you know, kind of reality of the mundane, you know, kind of part of going to an, uh, you know, an urban dive, you know, if you live in downtown or wherever in New York, yeah. um, but also kind of the mythology of the urban, um, yeah, posed by early Parisians, like, you know, uh, urban Parisians, like um, Mene and... Um, yeah, Mene the Folie de Berger, yeah. we, we all see that. And we all yeah. want to drink this drink. We don't know what it is. Yes, yeah, we all I, stand think, there. I, I think it's, I think it's a, it's a um, gin martini. Yeah, we want that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and... Um, you know, I, th I think that I wanted this painting very much to be a question in the end. It's like, is this a friendly place? Um, and uh, I think it's, it's it's a story. I was thinking very much about stories about um, immigrants or ingenues. Um, you know, um, entering um, a new, exciting uh, place or a class of people. And uh, wondering, am I glamorous enough? Is this friendly? Yeah. Um, and and you know, it's a place 
you know, filled with friendliness and, you know, but also, you know, a place of shadows and, um, and I like to play with still life as something that is a signifier or allegorical, like an extinguished candle or, um, uh, you know, plants that are withering. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love that. The poems are beautiful and, uh, yeah. So, mm. um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's also just a person with being a person with social anxiety. I think this is <laughs> about social anxiety. Yeah, it's, you know, yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's about uh, it's a painting about arrival. Yeah, and some of the figures uh, we recognize from they shift from painting to painting, like this one with the diamond shaped uh, Arlequin type thing that we saw in. Uh, nightmare and this person with the blonde hair that I recognize in one of the apartments and uh, also the different genres that we uh, we recognize that you are so seeped in art history that still life and uh, um, all these uh, um, things that uh, make the the fabric of this art so much richer for for all of us um, there's also the the kind of uh rubbery limbs and you we have another uh painting that we didn't show this time where there's someone in the yard kind of posing with a rubbery limb and someone was saying it's like fluid limbs oh gender fluid and they thought that was what you were going for and i promised i would ask if that okay. is a good reading well i i wasn't going for gender fluid but i was going for something uh for um, someone who's half real, like they're not. It's 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 also uh, it's a world uh, that in which people can bend and yeah. you know turn into. They're open to change their shape, um, and um, they're also, you know, a little bit like rubber marionettes. They are, uh, you know, there is something, um, something funny about maybe like you know, sort of. I don't know, being in an abject <laughs> place. And I guess, you know, uh, humor is important to me. Um, I I love uh, dignity and archness and, you know, all of that um, very kind of Rubensian stuff. But like, um, but it's, it's very important for me to kind of trash all of that at the same time. And, um, and to, you know, going to be a little crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, that's sort of where the nose is and the limbs and that sort of stuff comes from the clown nose. Um, you know, um, it's... So we'll get to some of the clown no noses. Uh, this corner is one of my favorites in the that we put together. Um, unlike the other shows where the uh, drawings were kind of salon hang separately from the paintings and then the sketchbooks were separate. We mm -hmm. had the uh, good fortune of someone allowing us to put them all together. So we have the sketchbooks that you see the beginning of a work, then you see how it evolves into drawings and paintings. And this corner has what you call fag puddles, which I don't believe is a real term. I think it's a term that you invented right yeah um so i these are i mean i did the first few and i didn't really know what to call them and then one day i was like oh that's a that's a bag bottle i just know it yeah. <laughs> um but you know I, I and then i kept doing them because they are sort of like a collection of things that i want to paint um but at the same time a lot of, you know the, the form that they take for me is always kind of droopy and and sort of blimp and like it's you know um it's funny um it's important to me that they're kind of leaky as well um sort so of like we have a, the the sketch here and then you know a sketch of something that looks like uh an encased fag puddle and then we have uh the witnesses and it looks like a museum case and then we have these elements that uh, are the droopy things. Um, mm -hmm. Why don't we look at one painting? Um, I'm just 
mindful of the time, uh, Salman, and we have so much more that we want to discuss. But you have uh, the fag puddles, sometimes separate, sometimes in your sketchbook, but sometimes you have them in a museum setting. And this is part, this was shown at the Frick Collection as uh, Queer Views and Old Masters, Living Histories. Um, can you can you talk about this specific fag puddle and the two figures that are uh, staring at it? Um, I I love painting vitrines. I think they're very just they're just very fun to paint. Um, and the idea of them is very um, it's just kind of delicious to me, especially if they're uh, the sh it's like if it's like a um, sort of a modernist like a shape um, of the legs kind of tapering down with like vine or nice wood. And um, um, I had been doing this composition of um, this surreal museological like space in which there's lots of sculpture. And, um, my initial thought was that I wanted to paint um, a series of paintings about people looking at each other across art. And um, and that they were have they have some they're making some kind of communication or compromise across art and um, this was shown at the Frick opposite uh, Vermeer painting and I was supposed to react to the Vermeer painting and I was like How, I can't really do that <laughs> but I will try my best um, and so I was I was thinking about bag puddles as uh, you know, kind of heaps of of treasure of colonial sort of blunder of you know my of of sort of uh, of um, of greed for um, sort of sex and money and but also uh, um, it's a, like a sort of like a capitalist feast but also and it, you know it's fabulous and it's exhausted um, but it's and it's also to me a kind of um, like a saggy sort of failure like you know it's done <laughs> um yeah. you know and there is a hint of abandonment about it um um i had been thinking about um the urinal um for a while um that is in um um here what's the name of the artist my god like duchamp yeah of course duchamp yeah. um and so you know, this this was like a sort of like a a thought that came in the end to me um, yeah. when the painting was finishing. But um, I, I I love sort of painting different textures in a fact puddle, like shoes or uh, furs, uh, sort of towels or satin, or silk, um, liquid. Um, but also like you know, I enjoy that it's slightly offensive. <laughs> Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. and uh, um, and as you said, humorous—not just the nose, but the whole situation has a kind of strangeness. And someone in the remarks said that you know the carpet looks almost like a uh, one of Ensor's uh, things, with also with hats and and costumes. And then you have these incredible drawings that we could include, where again it's uh, body parts uh, alluding to some sort of. Uh, almost like an orgy, but then also objects. And as you said, it's desire and disgust. It's it's all of it together within a kind of vitrine uh, that we try to imitate and put your sketchbooks within a vitrine. So, so it yeah. goes together. And then uh, some of the fag puddles with the underwear uh, and some, some different heads from different cultures. Uh, this one, fag puddle number seven, that looks almost like a birthday cake. Uh, although, yes. I don't know, if this is appropriate for a seven-year-old. <laughs> no, this was this was supposed to be a uh, the illustration for a chapter of a book that my friend was doing, and then I put it in the show anyway. But it was chapter okay. seven. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but yes. again, with the human and the art and all of it together, and. Um, you know, just uh, bringing all these fat puddles and they occupy this corner. And then we have two more uh, elements and I'm just gonna 
uh, go quickly because uh, we only have 10 minutes and maybe we will be able to take some of the questions, but we have a whole uh, section of portraits which are absolutely beautiful. And we used your quote where you say that uh, you paint from memories and feelings and more, more or less like what you said about your childhood memories and memory related to scent, related to the texture of the fabrics, et cetera. And um, they're just so beautifully painted. This is a tiny little one and it is just incredible in terms of the sumptuousness of the uh, paint and the little cigarette glow. Um, love the hair. No one is clean shaven there. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's like, uh, um, I think I'm reaching a point where I might like go back to models for a little bit. Um, but I, for the past five years, I've just been painting from imagination. Um, and um, that means sometimes like, you know, it's, um, I have someone specific in mind that I'm thinking about their face and especially if it's a friend um, or someone I know really well. Um, so that, I, you know, not only to remember them and love them while I'm, I'm painting, but also um, to try to make a, something new with my hand because um there's also something like a hand memory so like if I'm yeah. um I always end up making the same face my hand makes the same face again and again and sometimes I'm just like no you should think about someone else's face and try to remember it like you know there's so many different kinds of noses that I know from uncles from cousins like yeah. friends like you know I there's so many different kinds of hairstyles that I know like and so it becomes a kind of like amalgam of memories and desires and also, you know, uh, of the of the grotesque as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right, um, right. <laughs> and, and here again, you know, I think that one of the things we love about the show is that you get an insight into your process, uh, your mm -hmm. creative process, your artistic process. So we have the the sketchbooks, which are usually with ballpoint pen and small, really tiny. And then we see the painting and then we see some art historical indirect models and then the memory that goes in um, and art historical models from, from South Asia and from Europe and from America and uh, as well as contemporary elements. Uh, and some elements that recur, hairy legs, of course, but also a single sneaker. We have a lot of underwear, a lot of butt cracks. Um, you know, children love to look and find those things <laughs> as well. Um, yeah. And some incredible painting. I mean, no one paints a tear like that. Um, and a lot of candles recur as well with some of the warmer colors. Uh, so and the charcoal on paper with the with the phone giving it almost like a religious glow, which is uh, incredible. Just to say that we, um, in honor of Salman coming to the Rose, we put together a, collect, a collection of Goyas, a collection of some Cezanne with green breast strokes, uh, Manet, uh -huh. Uh, some some works from our permanent collection that really resonated with with some of the works, uh, and the grotesque uh, reminded us of uh, Nicole Eisen. Oh, man. And this section, which is the opposite wall of the family, is the chosen family. These amazing interior spaces, um, where that you call them private, deeply comfortable spaces that give dignity and safety to your boys and to the boys in the painting, but also to you. And it's really moving that we have, you know, these interior spaces that are clearly not Lahore, clearly not the your mother and aunties, but no less luscious and with fabrics and with some of your uh, new family, I, you know, beautiful, beautiful. And I saw, them in the bar with the oh yeah yes yeah I mean I and sometimes even with the interiors I'm trying to like 
this particular interior I remember it a couple of times um, because it was um, a 200 square foot apartment, a one bedroom apartment on Fifth Street. Very small, but very, 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 you know, kind of like typically East Village. Um, and uh, I think this part particularly has been evoked a lot of times. <laughs> um, and um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that is like, you know, the site of a lot of my um, right. fun so, children's so, family years. Solomon, we have three minutes left. So I'm just going to show uh, some of the works and then maybe look at some of the questions that are coming sure. up. Uh, um, this is Lazy Boy, also an interior, um, evoking maybe the reclining nude, but really mixing it up. It's not just not a woman, it's a man, and definitely not posing in a sexy pose, but with yesterday's pizza and the computer and the underwear and with a sense of humor uh, and really beautiful. So um, dealing with uh, tradition, but also undoing tradition and redoing and reconfiguring it. Uh, friend, three friends in a cab and people always remark on how beautiful the, the cityscape is from the cab window. Um, and this is again, um, I wanted to end with this work because it belongs to the Rose Art Museum. We were very lucky to uh, acquire it through a gift from Adam and Rachel Green, Boys in Bed. This is the small, tiny drawing. Uh, and this is the beautiful work where it's not just the interior that gives them space. It's also the their bodies kind of frame them as a comfortable, safe space for them. Um, it's uh yeah there are sort of there are a bunch of these paintings that I did I haven't done them for a while but they're um just they're kind of cute and intimate <laughs> um and uh you know this one in particular I've been thinking about I'm not sure if this is obvious or not but like it's just some sort of uh not just a pillow fight but Saint George kind of slaying the dragon and <laughs> <laughs> and it ended up in a kind of bit of fight um sort of pose and um you know it was important for me to have a, a little touch of sort of technology I like painting laptops and um to have this idea that maybe you know this is also very self-conscious I mean perhaps this is being performed for for the computer um but in general, I think I, you know, I think that my old master education, it just is in love with painting beds and sheets and um, um, trappings of um, comfort and grime that can become delicious somehow. All right. So thank you, Salman. I, there are a lot of questions and there's some people who asked it's eight o'clock, but if we can stay a little longer to answer a few questions. So I'm just gonna um, bring um, to, um, you know, there are 17 questions. I'm gonna try to, to go through them really quickly. So some questions from RISD, a lot of people from RISD who love you are asking, Tiepolo, Vuillard, and Enzor, were they, are they some of your favorites? Oh, yes. I, at Tiepolo, I came too late. Uh, I hated Tiepolo for a long time because Tiepolo himself came to the scene a little bit later. Like, he's one of the few, like, 18th century Italian artists um, when really, like, the kind of focus of the 18th century moved to France and um, the way of uh, sort of painting and the mood was, I feel like, uh, was very, very um, different. Um, and um, I feel like, I, of course, like he is a, you know, he's an incredible painter, but I think that as a conclusion to all the brilliant, amazing, uh, you know, Italian painters that came before him, not the best <laughs> conclusion, uh, but you know, Ensor and Vuillard, like 
of course like who can who can live without them indeed so yes. a lot of the art historical references people see and um and of course but when you use them, you make them all your own, which is wonderful. There are two really distinct questions. One is about your painting process. We can see we have a lot of art students and artists here. And I know that a lot of your work and I saw in your studio are on panel and then uh, how you create it. Um, so we saw that you have the sketchbooks, but then how you build your painting process and the material, the oil paint, and this, how you do that. So briefly, if you could address that. OK, it's a very traditional uh, way that I do it still. I mean, that may change. Uh, but I, um, in the past, used to make my own everything, used to like chop wood, and then like stretch the canvas on it, and then gesso it. And then gesso it again, and then sand it and gesso it um, uh, three times. and. I don't do that anymore. Now I get gesso canvases and linen uh, or a panel. Um, but the panel is uh, prepared with uh, a raw umber under sort of just like a raw umber ground. And um, and then, um, especially if it's a small or a medium painting, I just, I go at it with the paint directly. So there's no drawing. Um, you know, there sometimes is a pre-drawing, which is like on a, um, with a ballpoint on a piece of paper, a small piece of paper like you showed. And, um, but otherwise I just, I try to make it low stakes and just calm down and just try to have fun. Right. So there's another really interesting question. Um, in your work, do you find that nudity is more often a reflection of vulnerability or a sense of empowerment? and acceptance of identity, like the boy in the necklace, or does it operate as both? So really interesting. Thank you, uh, Kiman Asyanyan, who sent who sent that question to well, us. Thank you, well, that's a good question. I, there is definitely both. Uh, I think, you know, there is uh, sometimes a sense of like elegance and grace and dignity and empowerment. Um, in some of the paintings and in others, there is a you know a deep sense of shame and humor and um, and um, and you know also um, kind of digging into um, the historical imagination that has to do with literature and pictures that were produced in in Western colonies all over the world about. Um, you know, the people that were conquered there and what their bodies were like and, you know, what were the treasures that um, were sort of appealing to come back to the urban centers of the West and make it into the museum vitrines that, you know, we see a lot of the fag puddles in. And, um, and uh, so, you know, there is a, a sense of... Um, self-love and you know great sort of victory but also a sense sometimes a sense of um sense of defeat but and also i think um i would definitely like to say like a, a sense of subversion of um of um of ideas that are prickly you know um about uh, ideas held in the Western, larger Western imagination about bodies. Um, and speaking of bodies, it's, so, you know, it's a, just very important to me to talk about bodies and paint bodies, especially like, you know, at a time like now when we politically, like just in the world, we're talking about the value of bodies and, you know, whose pain is worth how much, you know. Um, and um, so it's both sort of physical and also a presentation. Right. Um, there are two more questions. One is very lighthearted and the other one is heavier. So I'll start with the lighthearted one. An anonymous attendee asks, many of your interiors are messy and in disarray. Is this also true of life? <laughs> Yeah, I live in a, uh, you know, East Village has small apartments, so like, it, you know, like it, making a mess is very easy. Like I just come in and throw my jacket somewhere and it's messy. 
Right. <laughs> if there is no longer any order. So okay. I, I do clean up a lot. I'm a very tidy, organized person. But but very often, like, I'm just cleaning because, like, this, like, if I move one thing, you know, um, around, um, it's it's no longer organized and tidy. Uh, my studio is very big, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, but, you know, um, if I'm sort of going crazy over a painting, like, and if someone's supposed to come over a month later, like, I have to clean for, like, two hours, like... It's a, uh, yeah, it's a lot of mess. I'm a hoarder too, so <laughs> I have so, to have purging, yeah. Yeah, so um, people mentioned Cezanne-esque brushstrokes here, and we actually did have a Cezanne next to your work. And, yes. uh, but the, the we're gonna end with uh, a question. How do you capture queer melancholy in your paintings? Very poetic. Yeah, I mean, I try to feel it while I'm, while I'm painting it, yeah. and uh, that doesn't always is it doesn't always work uh, because I I and you know when it does like it's it means so much to me that I can just use that energy for like a lifetime. But um, you know, I I think I always start a painting with. Uh, a portrait and a face and I would like to share that you know when I was at Pratt where I went to school I did a lot of traditional portraits and one of the art historian teachers my professors who I really admired and who I had like long kind of conversations with which is just like why do you want to do this it's so dead like just don't do it anymore uh, just like you can do so much more and I feel that but even now, like I am very much that person. And to start with a face is to relate to it to me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there are very few times that the whole composition isn't like the extension of a mood um, of, of a figure within the painting. And um, that, you know, but I'm lucky I can I can feel with you know what I'm um, what I'm painting so yeah that's how I use that energy <laughs> so uh thanks for staying for an extra 10 minutes uh I know you have to go um and thanks to the audience for staying for such a long time and uh asking more questions I thought it would be interesting to end with this painting because the position is that of melancholy like Durer's Melancholia um, but I would say that the range of emotions, queer and human, not just queer emotions, is uh, never ending. There is joy, there is fear, there is desire, there is passion, and there is also sadness and melancholy. So thank you for capturing all these human emotions with such beauty and sensitivity and um just pizzazz. Um, thank you so much, Salman, for joining us. I could talk to you for hours and probably will uh, as uh, the yeah. years go by. <laughs> and everyone, come see our show. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, and bye-bye. Um, thank you. Bye.